All right, we're going to get started. Oh, sorry, microphone. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, um, for convening after a short break. We're being aggressive with timekeeping now. Um, so I want to introduce the next plenary panel that Andres and I came up with for the program. We're very excited about this one. Um, so I'm actually going to first mention who the speakers are, because I want to tell you how the five of us sort of came up with the topic of our panel, um, which is wicked problems and collective intelligence. So we have, um, I guess we're going to go in order of, we're going to have Sridhar first, then Tom, then Deborah, then Alex. So the five of us were emailing to sort of think of how to introduce the um, panel. And um, we decided that the things that all four of them are working on, so these are, I mean, these are people who, who need no introduction. The things they're working on are very complex, very interesting problems. And so we decided that we wanted to sort of signal the real world application of the things that they're working on and how complicated and complex a lot of the problems are. So to me as an academic, I immediately have this like jargony term, which is wicked problems. Um, it turned out that, sorry, this, it turns out that this is not a phrase that was known to some. Right. Here we go. So um, we had to sort of define it together. So this is all of us like emailing and then Sridhar actually blogged about it. So I'm going to show you his blog on Wicked Problems. So Wicked Problems, which is maybe something, maybe this is jargon that's known to this community. So Wicked Problem is just a problem that's really hard to solve. It's complex. There's a lot of interdependencies. Uh, solving one part of it means other problems emerge in other ways. So it's just me. It's just signaling like a complex problem, right? So we're emailing about this, and I have this assumption as an academic that it's known to everyone. But then it turns out that all of them are actually Googling it to find the definition <laughs> and um, emailing it to each other. So they sense made what wicked problems were. And then this was fun, I thought. So then Sridhar actually blogged about it. So he has a cool blog, which you can go look at. So he was, he's saying on his blog, he's saying, turns out I solve wicked problems. And he actually found the historical root of the phrase. Turns out it came from management science, where he's actually an editor. <laughs> so he's editing management science, um, has been contributing there for 20, 30 years now, and, and wasn't aware that this is what he is doing as a management scientist, is solving wicked problems. Um, so uh, wicked problems can only get solved through collective intelligence. And the four of them are going to give us a lot of thoughts on how that's going to happen. Um, so we're going to do, uh, they're going to have about 12 minute presentations and then we'll have um, a very short time for some really focused, good Q&A. So with that, I'm going to have Alice Reader. There we go. Okay. So please join me in welcoming Sridhar. Well, Anita, thank you for uh, asking me to speak. I didn't know why you would ask me to speak. Uh, this was a few months ago. I wasn't paying attention. I said yes. And then uh, a few weeks later, I asked her, so what is this conference again? Who are the people? What am I talking about? Uh, she said, don't worry about it. It'll be great. It'll be great. And uh, so finally, uh, I got an email from uh, Melissa. I had to Google you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that all of you are famous people, but I don't know who you are. Uh, <laughs> but I, get the, I guess the good news is you don't know who I am. So, uh, <laughs> so it works out. It works out uh, fine. Uh, I want to talk about something that is not my full-time job, but it became my full-time job, uh, uh, or nearly full-time job, the past few years after I sold my software company to, to SAP. Uh, I think the previous speaker said, uh, even uh, if you had, uh, if you're independently wealthy, you're going to, uh, you know, keep doing some work. And so, when I sold my software companies about six years ago, I became independently wealthy. And after a couple of years of doing nothing, uh, uh, it's right actually. We we can't not do nothing for 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 too long. So, uh, I decided to look into this. So this is the kind of emails I get every morning. So this is a real world. Uh, uh, the question is, what can we do about this? Okay, so I'm going to show you. Uh, is my voice loud enough? I have to be standing here. Okay. So my first question is, why should we do anything? I bring this up because it's unclear to me actually as I had two years of doing nothing uh, to think about what is the meaning of life, right? I don't have the answer. 
but doing nothing was not the answer. So, uh, so finally, I said, you know, why should we do anything? And this is what I came up with. Uh, it is, if you have the luxury of doing nothing, uh, then uh, the reason for doing something is basically a sense of self-satisfaction uh, and some feeling of, uh, uh, you know, passing time, as I'm saying it. Right? Uh, and evidently, I'm not the first guy to come up with it. There are like tons and tons of books written on happiness and purpose-driven life and, and things of that type. Things I never took into account because I was too busy selling coffee. Okay? Uh, when you have something to do, you don't think about happiness. And so, right? When you have nothing to do, that's when you think about it. Right? So I started thinking, what can I do as a person who does operations management, supply chain, logistics, software, right? Uh, and this is what I came up with. I created a company called OrganJet, and it has two features. First, it tells people where they could list so that they don't have to die. Okay? This may come to you as a surprise, but most people waiting on transplant lists actually don't know that they can multiple list. In fact, Steve Jobs didn't know it because his wife was sitting around doing nothing for a while. Uh, she spent, I think, hours and hours and weeks scanning through what are called SRTR files uh, to figure out where he should list. But because he was a rich guy, uh, she listed him in 12 places, 12 transplant centers. And because he had a private jet, uh, when somebody died in Memphis, Tennessee, he got a phone call, he could get on his Gulf Street go get his transplant, come back, and release the iPad. Right? So I started thinking, do you have to be a billionaire to do this with a wife with all of free time? Or can you be an average citizen and still do exactly what Steve Jobs did? So my, job, my, my challenge to myself was for a democratic. And the answer is yes. It turns out we can read these SRPR files, digitize it, put it on Google Maps, and you can put your zip code and press a button, and in less than 0.03 seconds, you will find the answer to which transplant center you should list to, and you don't need six weeks of work <laughs> from your wife. The bigger problem is, how do you get an on-demand chat <laughs> to get you from A to B? It turns out, uh, the great thing about this country is there are a lot of very rich people with many private jets doing nothing. Right? If you may not know this, there are 18,000 private jets in this country, in 5,500 airports, that have utilization less than 40%. I know people with two or three planes, and I ask them, why do you have all these planes? But to them, it's like watches. They bought one, and they thought, you know what, with the new Citation 10 came up, I really don't want to give up my old one, why don't I buy a second? And then they have a third one, like a Hawker 800. Right? Uh, and so these planes are sitting around. So I said, how about this, guys? You give me these planes. Don't do it for free because you're rich people and you don't do free things. Right? I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm in a business school, so I don't really expect people to do things out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, what I'm going to do is to make sure that your marginal cost is paid. Right? And so I have now generally like an Uber for private. So that's kind of it. It's been in operations for a while. We have saved a few hundred lives by now. So, you know, so this, this is actually a real thing. These are typical flight patterns. So what happens is the wait times on the coasts, Boston is five to six years. California is 10 years, as we saw. Chicago is pretty bad. And in the mid of the country, the wait times are two years, maybe one and a half years, three years. And for decades, people had been trying to solve this problem to say, why can't people share the organs more broadly? And for 30 years, the answer has been, no, we are not going to do it. We are not going to give these damn Yankees good Christian organs from Arkansas. We're not going to do it, okay? Uh, and if you go to the website, you'll see real vitriol. And I'm giving you the nicest part of the uh, website uh, out there, okay? Uh, 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 right? And so all attempts to solve the geographic disparity for 30 years have failed. And so my idea of not actually expecting people to do the right thing, but rather take advantage of the fact that there is data and all these rich people with jets uh, to democratize Steve Jobs has become, in some sense, the only useful solution that, you know, that, that has come. 
now I'm a professor, so at some point I have to write a management science paper. So I did. Uh, and for those of you who like these kind of models, each transplant center is a queuing system. People come and wait in line to get a transplant. And when organ comes, that's like a service. Uh, and what you're going to get is a queuing system where people are getting queued up. And this is called overcrowded queues because the arrival to the queue is greater than the number of organs. So supply of organs is an issue, which is how I approach this. And then people die while they're waiting, and that's called abandonment. It's called a queuing model with abandonment, overcrowded queuing with abandonment. So it's a network of overcrowded queues with abandonment. And multiple listing means it's a selfish routing game. If you're a computer science major, you may have heard of something called selfish routing on a network. So basically, I wrote a management science paper that organ transplantation is selfish routing on an overcrowded network. It won the best paper award <laughs> published in management science. Uh, the important thing is it actually provides a new equilibrium, which is a Rawls interval, which means that it makes the worst of less work. So it reduces the maximum wait times period. Of course, it's going to increase the wait times in other places, but for two years, it goes up to three and a half years, and somebody is waiting for nine years, it goes down to six. But the secondary benefit I didn't expect when I did it is many of the organs in response and others are being wasted. Because the wait times are not very large, they can expect to get a better organ soon. But with multiple listening, people will just their organs and say, come on, take that. But actually, more transplants get that, more life gets saved, and that's why all of them are So, when I started reading about wicked problems, which is basically 24 or 48 hours ago, uh, <laughs> I realized I was dealing with this. And the bigger problem in this country and around the world is that we don't have enough organs. And much of the effort is really in getting us to sign up in DMVs because they're not going to be enough organs. But I think of that as not working out in the short run because first you have to sign up and then I'm waiting for you to die. I mean, a particularly good way for me to get organs. So what I thought was missing was people who are already dead, who are not organ. How can we get them? What the law allows is that you can ask the next And more than 70% of next of kids obviously say no because they're the idea I came up with was a nudge video where somebody died, you ask their husband and son, this is a typical approach, this is actual enough. none of what I'm saying is true. Obama like me, very very like My father had a massive stroke. He was on life support. And at one point, someone came up to us in the hospital and asked if we would donate my father's organs. My daughter had passed away. Her name was Riley. She was five years old. The decision for organ donation came early in the process. And I think the timing for us was just something I couldn't comprehend. My mother was very upset. How disrespectful. My husband's not even dead an hour, and you're asking me this question. Ever since then, I've always thought about that. We could have helped so many people. And we were so stuck in our own grief that we didn't think about other people. And I know my dad would have liked that. People mourn differently. They deal with trauma differently. There really is no way you can become comfortable with the loss of a child. We just knew that we had to keep this memory alive in some shape or form. The only way at that point I could think of was to donate his organ to someone. Sometimes tragedy happened, but if you can find something good out of it, no telling who lives you can save. It's not just keeping me alive, you're saving lives. Oh, I'm so proud of my baby. She only lived to be 13 months, but she got to save three lives of three other children. 
Their mothers don't have to suffer like I have to suffer. When my mom passed away, we decided that yes, she would want to give the gift of tissue as well. Her organs saved three people and her tissue enhanced the lives of over 43 others. There's a lot of misunderstandings, unfortunately, in the faith communities. You know, we advocate for a lot of things. You know, the care of the poor and the sick, and, and this falls under that. There's no restrictions when it comes to faith, and I think that it shows way more your faith and your devotion to God, whatever God you worship, that, that you would say, well, how can I serve? The best way to honor the memory that you have for anybody is to allow them to be a hero, and that's exactly how I view my donor. There isn't a single day where we don't thank our donor family. That one decision of theirs literally changed our entire lives. I feel really fortunate that he's healthy and the quality of his life is so much better. We all are here to help one another any which way we can. You never want to lose anyone, but if you love them, a part of them is somewhere living, happy, and feeling grateful because there is no greater gift than the gift of life. And that's it. Uh, so next. So I think that may be the hardest talk I've ever had to talk. <laughs> but I'm going to try to do it. I'd like to start by, are you telling me to move this way? Oh, you mean for the mic? Is that, is that, is that for sound purposes? Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, let me use this thing. OK, so uh, can you hear me? Does this the mic work? OK. Uh, I want to try to follow that talk by doing three things. First, I want to talk about a topic that I assume all of you are interested in, that is collective intelligence. But I'm going to try to give you a different perspective of a way of thinking about that. Then I'll talk about why I think that's connected with wicked problems. And then I'll give some examples involving climate change. So first, for many years, I thought about collective intelligence as a property that certain systems had. Uh, for instance, in the Handbook of Collective Intelligence that I co-edited with Michael Bernstein, we defined collective intelligence as groups of individuals acting collectively in ways that seem intelligent. Now, it turns out every word in that definition is significant, and we unpacked those words in that article. Uh, but I think it's and I always interpreted that as a statement of a property of systems, that you were collectively intelligent if you had this property. But I gradually began to realize that there was another way of thinking about this, in a certain sense, another way of reading this definition, and another important kind of collective intelligence, which is not just a property that some systems have, but the systems that have that property. Uh, for instance, when I was writing the draft of my most recent book, I talked about collectively intelligent systems a lot. And that was a pretty big mouthful to say many, many times in the course of the text. So I ended up abbreviating it, abbreviating it as CIs, CIs for collective intelligence system by analogy to AIs, which some people use. But I still didn't really like that abbreviation. It, it seemed kind of hokey or something. And eventually, I realized there was another word that I thought was pretty cool, which was superminds. So it turns out that is an English word. It's defined in some dictionaries as uh, combinations of minds that are very effective. And I think that captures the meaning of what we want to say. So I would now define a supermind as a group of individuals acting collectively in ways that seem intelligent. And I ended up using superminds everywhere in my book in the final version that I had previously written CIs. And I even picked that name as the title of the book. Now, one of the things I like about this is that when you start looking at the world from that point of view, that there are superminds that are collectively intelligent systems in the world, 
when you look at the world that way, you see that there are a whole bunch of superminds all around us. In fact, with apology to Mary, who talked about ghosts earlier today, I think it's interesting to think about these superminds in the world as ghosts. They're powerful entities. They're all around us. They're all, all the time. But they're mostly invisible unless you know how to look. For instance, every hierarchical company that you've ever heard of is a kind of supermind, a collectively intelligent entity, individuals that act collectively in ways that seem intelligent. Every democracy is a supermind, whether it's in a government or a club or some other group. Very importantly, I think every market is a supermind. Every community is a supermind, whether it's a global scientific community like the one shown in this picture, or a neighborhood, or many other kinds of groups. So I think one of the most important things, at least from my point of view, that I did in my recent book, Superminds, was to identify a taxonomy of five different types of superminds, categorized according to how they make decisions. So the first and most obvious kind of supermind is a hierarchy. So hierarchies are groups where the superminds, where the group decisions are made by delegating them to specific individuals. Group. Another, the second kind of supermind is democracies, where the group decisions are made by voting. The third kind of supermind is markets where the group decisions are made essentially the combination of a whole bunch of pairwise agreements between individual buyers and sellers. And a fourth kind of supermind is communities, where the group decisions are made by a kind of informal consensus based on shared norms and reputations. Now, all four of those kinds of superminds require at least some amount of cooperation among the people in the group or the individuals. But if you have no cooperation among the individuals in the group, then you have the fifth kind of superminds, which I call ecosystems, where group decisions are made by the law of the jungle. Whoever has the most power gets what they want and the survival of the fittest. So I wouldn't necessarily claim that this explains all superminds, but I do think that this is a pretty comprehensive taxonomy of the important ways that groups or institutions can make decisions and of very important types of collectively intelligent systems. So what does that have to do with wicked problems? Well, I think you could define wicked problems by saying that tame problems are ones where there is a correct answer and there's usually some kind of algorithm that either people or computers can follow to get to that answer. Maybe more than one, but there are correct answers. Wicked problems, in contrast, are ones where there isn't a correct answer, where to know what's good or what's effective about dealing with a wicked problem usually requires multiple points of view, multiple perspectives, multiple values. In other words, as Melissa said in introducing the panel, you actually stole one of my punchlines, but I think it actually is a kind of profound insight that wicked problems can only be effectively addressed by collectively intelligent systems. They can only be addressed by groups of individuals, superminds. Now, what could that look like? Let me tell you just a little bit about work we've done over the last decade or so on the collective in, in the, on the wicked problem of what to do about global climate change. If ever there was a wicked problem, that's one. There's no single right answer. There's all kinds of points of view. Where different people think different things are important, etc. So it's clearly a wicked problem. 
The first thing we did about applying collective intelligence to this problem was to try to crowdsource the problem. So we created an online platform called Climate Collab and an online community of people all over the world using this platform. The community now includes over 120,000 people from all over the world, including students, policymakers, scientists, business people, and many, many others. Together, these people are developing and evaluating proposals for what to do about the overall problem, all the way from how to generate electricity with fewer emissions, to how to reduce carbon emissions from buildings or from transportation, to how to change public attitudes about climate. And one of the nice things that came out of this crowdsourcing process was the emergence of some pretty interesting innovative ideas. Just to give you one example, one of my favorite ones was an idea for something called the Sun Saluter, which was a rotating solar panel, very low cost, that generated electricity and also at the same time clean drinking water to critical needs for millions of people all over the world. One of the things I think was particularly interesting about this example is that the idea came from the young woman pictured there who had the idea when she was only 16 years old and later dropped out of Princeton to pursue this idea full time. So I think that example illustrates how this kind of crowdsourcing based collective intelligence, you could call it in a sense a kind of market. So this kind of collective intelligence can come up with some pretty interesting ideas from some pretty unexpected places. But I think just coming up with ideas isn't alone nearly enough to solve the problem of climate change. To even have any uh, hope of effectively addressing climate change, we have to change not just the ideas we have, but the decisions we make. And I think the taxonomy of the five types of superminds that I talked about and talk about in much more detail in my book, I think that taxonomy can help us think more systematically about how we might address the problem of climate change. I have a whole chapter in the book about that question. Uh, for instance, you could imagine using communities and the norms of communities to influence people to do things like drive smaller cars or take airplanes more less frequently. Uh, that might be a value, but it's almost certainly not enough to really figure out how to effectively reduce emissions. Another way you could address the problem would be to have hierarchical governments pass laws or establish regulations about what kind of fuel economy cars should have or what kind of insulation is required in buildings. Uh, but that too is a pretty blunt instrument uh, since it's very kind of rigid rules that apply to everyone independent of the conditions. A much more effective way of addressing the problem would be to use markets, which can do very detailed decisions taking into account lots of things. But markets don't actually deal with this problem very effectively so far in most cases because they don't put any value at all on reducing carbon emissions. It's what economists call an externality. One way of addressing that would be to have hierarchical governments pass laws that say you have to include the costs of emissions in what happens in a market, uh, one, for instance, by doing carbon taxes or something like that. But that doesn't look like it's anywhere near happening in this country, for sure, the second largest carbon emitter in the world. And so to do that, you might need to change the, the voters in democracies to elect representatives that would do that. And to do that, you probably need to change the community norms so voters would put more value on that. Uh, one way that seems that is closest to having some value now is the process that the UN is convening with the, Clare, the Paris Climate Agreements, where uh, it's essentially a community of countries. The countries haven't agreed to any binding things, but they are acting as a community who care about their reputations with other countries in, as a way of influencing countries and people to reduce their emissions. So is that the best solution? I don't think it's necessarily the best solution. I think there may well be 
much more creative ways of combining these different kinds of superminds to deal with this problem. And I think this community of all communities should be a center of how people think about or where people think about creative ways of combining different kinds of superminds to deal with important problems. So the thought I'd like to leave you with is that if you want to effectively deal with wicked problems, you should not think about what's the best solution to the problem. What we should instead think about is what possibly innovative combinations of superminds can effectively deal with the problem. Thank you. Um, but uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about democratizing innovation for ending extinction. I have way too many slides, so I'll be doing it at about three times the speed. But um, this, is my, this was my normal day job. I'm, I'm normally, I was an evolutionary biologist that, that uh, tried to understand why certain species go extinct while others survive after environmental change. Uh, spent a lot of time thinking about the future while holding lemurs. Uh, but, but my work as in, in places like Madagascar led me to start and create around the world a series of national parks uh, because that's what conservationists did and it was a conservation biologist including creating the first national park in Afghanistan. Um, and this has been the trend overall. We have greatly increased the number of protected areas around the world. So how are we actually doing in the 30 something years since the Society of Conservation Biology is working? Well, every major group of vertebrates is in a state of decline. Uh, we'll probably underestimate this background, you know, current rates of extinction are 1,000 to 10,000 times that of background extinction rate, and we have barely studied the majority of species out there, so we're probably underestimating it, because the very species we study have the, very, the characteristics that make them easier to study are the very characteristics that actually make them more prone to extinction, uh, and we're in the middle of this species extinction. And things are not going to get a little bit better. Uh, 9.7 billion people by 2050, which is 70% food, uh, billions of people emerging in the middle class who are going to eat you know, milk and beef and, and protein sources around the world. 70% more food is about a billion hectares. So what that means is the United States is 950 million hectares. So that is the clearance of the Congo Basin and the Amazon Basin at current rates just going on population growth. And it's not just deforestation. It's doubling of nitrogen, water, phosphorus, pesticides. Uh, and it's not just food. It's literally billions of people who want things like refrigeration and the impact of refrigeration will have on climate change. So uh, I started this company, Conservation X Labs, uh, to think about how we might actually accelerate the innovations that we need for conservation because it's clear that everything we were doing was insufficient. That everything I had done in my life uh, really, until this point, and I've been worried about extinction since I was eight, was, was insufficient. And our inspiration was really Bell Labs and this phrase of inventing ways for invention. Uh, and in particular, we take two approaches. We run our own labs. We build our own products. We're a nonprofit that spins out for-profit uh, institutions. Uh, and we also use social product development. So we use collective intelligence. We use specifically things like prizes and challenges, and then more recently has been mass collaboration as ways of sort of incentivizing people to find better solutions that in particular are revolutionary over evolutionary. So one part of my background is I was chief scientist at USAID. I created the global, um, the Grand Challenges for Development program uh, at the agency, uh, created our sort of DARPA for development there. And this was our very first Grand Challenge in 2009. It was saving lives at birth. Uh, it was specifically about this question. It was recognizing that from maternal and child care, right, this window between the onset of labor and 48 hours after delivery was where most people were dying. And that rate of death is 14 times higher in the developing world. And one place I worked in Afghanistan, the rate of dying in childbirth was 50% for some women. So when you gave birth, you had a one in two chance of survival. Right? So this was something we needed. But the problem was the USA couldn't build hospitals, provide well-trained medics, couldn't provide the equipment it needed to everyone everywhere in the last month. And we said, how do we make this window of time where you give birth irrelevant to your outcomes? How do we use innovation and how do we actually do it? And it took me 
a long time to do that because everyone in the global health department, the world's best experts said, we know all the solutions, we know all the answers, all we need was more money. But we don't have more money because we don't like as a government to give out money to other countries, even for good reasons. It's super well, uh, well documented. Saving lives at birth, we started running it uh, and we started seeing incredible innovations. I think one of the best known is the Odon device, which was the first new device for dealing with obstructed labor. It was an Argentinian car mechanic who saw a YouTube video of how you get a cork that's fallen into a, bot bot a bottle and said, this could be useful. And it was our grand challenge that actually allowed that device, went to the Argentinian health authorities. It's now being scaled up worldwide by Benton Dickinson. A group of undergrads at Duke created a solution called the Pratt Pouch, which was, again, a solution to deal with the fact that if you are a woman and you have HIV, if we give you antiretroviral drugs before birth, the chances of passing the HIV from your kids is, it can be greatly reduced. We can have an AIDS-free generation based on that. The problem was the cold chain. In no way for these last mile solutions could we have it. The students at Duke in an undergraduate class developed a solution that actually allowed us to store the retroviral drugs for up to a year for pennies uh, in those places. It's now scaling through PEPFAR. It was one of the top 10 innovative technologies of 2012. Uh, and then in the year, you know, as we've been running Saving Lives at Birth, we've leveraged $50 million of non-USG funding 4,000 innovators, 50% of the solutions came from the developing world, 50% of our solutions and our applications came from women. These are huge increases in the rate that, that USAID had in the past. 81 distinctive innovations uh, of almost 800,000 people's lives improved and 10,000 lives saved for $20 million. It was a fundamentally change, change way of doing things because USAID in 50 years of existence had probably less than 10 things that had scaled up worldwide that were truly impactful for a trillion dollars. So this was a way to fundamentally change that. And I said, and then we realized it was a form of procurement reform. It was actually taking out hidden bias. It simplified the application process. It, aid now, it's very difficult to just be able to apply for one, to a normal USAID grant. It created entire new communities of practice. Uh, it attracted unconventional solvers. We saw higher rates of invention, true invention that actually happened because we ran this year after year for 10 years. Uh, we saw donor coordination, and we literally changed the reality of what was possible for USAID's own folks as to how we could actually change these problems. So we said at Conservation X Labs, taking from my experience at USAID, could we fundamentally do this for conservation? Uh, and we ran this challenge in terms of uh, re-engineering aquaculture. 50% of your fish is grown on farms, but they literally catch wild fish, really small pelagic fish, to feed to farm fish. And the way they do so is decimating oceanic ch chains. Uh, it, was a small, it was a small grant. We ran it with the Australian government, but we got applications from 71 countries. It's a very technical project to replace the feed source and the protein source for aquaculture. And we saw incredible innovations, people taking CO2, turning it into protein, people taking insects into algae, into a whole set of new solutions. We also look for new ocean products. Uh, if you guys eat shrimp, this is a great picture of bycatch. The, what is on the uh, right-hand side is actually the fish, the shrimp that you get uh, that is caught. And the left-hand side is what is thrown away. There's all kinds of different problems. Uh, one of our innovators was New Way Foods, which created uh, shrimp out of red algae. It is now kosher. It is now vegan. And it doesn't have slavery by catching the teaching that's that, that's out there. Uh, but the most interesting thing we did was actually map out all the applicants. And we then had a map of the innovation space we didn't even know existed out there. You can find other solvers and solutions that were out there to bring the tail. We're running a whole series of other challenges, including one on reinventing air conditioning with the Rocket Institute and the Indian government. And we had this question. In some ways, we saw my co-founder was the former chief scientist at XPRIZE. You know, I did the grand challenges. We asked this question of what happens to the losers, right? They're not really losers. They're people that, for whatever reason, were not selected for a set of circumstances. And it seemed, in some ways, that prizes and challenges were very inefficient because you weren't capturing all of these ideas together. Uh, I'm really inspired by things like open source drug discovery, by quirky social product launch, by, by a whole collab, a whole set of 
institutions. And we also recognize that fields like practical medicine really which were not solving the problem only became effect effective when it became something like global health that became a multidisciplinary field. And we recognize that conservationists couldn't actually solve the problem by themselves. So we created something called a digital maker space where conservationists could post bombs, where, where individuals could come up with ideas to build teams around it. Uh, and we started running a prototyping prize and started working with our team here, Felicia Ng, uh, Nikki, Robert, um, Ong Su, Kang, uh, and others at CMU, as well as members of my team, to say, could we improve on mass collaboration in addition to competition around what we were doing? The amount of money was very low, $3,500 for the idea, 20,000 for the prototype. Um, we got uh, you know, 40, 40 prototyping grants, two scale-up grants. And we, what was amazing was for so little money, we actually got incredible ideas. Chimp Face is just one, which was how do we actually use AI and machine vision to track individual chimps on the internet. It was a single individual with no programming skills who was able to then build a team, get the Jane Goodall Institute to provide their full collection of all data that they had on chimps to, as a training data set. Uh, and they are now sort of building and, and, and taking it forward. But we had this question of if you could have collaboration, uh, and this work was done by Felicia, uh, we wanted to start asking these questions as we ran this prototyping competition. Did feedback, peer feedback, lead to better projects? So we paired half the finalist projects with peer mentors to determine the effects of peer feedback on project outcomes. Uh, this included partnering with the losers of that competition. Um, what we actually found was that, that there was, we didn't think people would be interested after having lost of actually still participating. 85% of them were interested, actually 50% engaged. All of them saw significant benefits uh, to peer advising. This is again work done by Felicia. Uh, <coughs> and they reported being interested in being a peer in, uh, advisor in the future. Um, they appreciated uh, continuous communication, which seems to actually reflect some of this idea of rapid iteration and engagement that happens. Uh, and, and, and it was, you know, we made sure that their expertise ma matched. Uh, it worked best when their expertise matched the needs, and that seems obvious. And we're trying to think about how to automate it. Um, we weren't actually able to identify because we did our judging panel, we weren't able to determine were they better innovations. But what it did lead to was a more engaged community that was involved in the solvers that harnessed the entire community uh, more efficiently. We are currently in the middle of asking this question, um, do dissimilar input, so do people who have complementary expertise but not the same expertise that might have different solutions for a problem do they have the ability to lead to more innovative solutions? Because again, our goal is to get at revolutionary solutions, not just incremental solutions in what we're doing. So we're in the process of asking this question uh, and trying to see what that comes up with. Uh, these are the questions that we're really looking forward to ask. You know, how do we automate these functions for social good? How do we automate the matching of expertise? Where does personality and behavior fit in? You know, what is, uh, is it better to have the single breakthrough or to have a mean improvement in the community itself? How do we measure expertise? What, you know, is it self-reported? Is it Uber ratings? What are the things, how do we measure, uh, wh what does it mean to be an adjacent, have adjacent expertise? Um, and then we're, we're running much bigger challenges, right, that are now at the, 500,000 to million to multiple million dollar challenges we're about to launch. And the question is, does the amount of money that we're talking about change the interactions of people in terms of what we're looking for? So with that, thank you very much. done. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things I think a lot about in terms of problem solving is that there's a lot of different stages going on. So I was, I was thinking about, uh, Tom, you're kind of five different 
classes of superminds, you've got democracy. Democracy is not just a vote, but you've got to choose the candidates, you've got to choose the issues, and then it continues in terms of Congress. And for problem solving in organizations, you've got to identify the problem, identify potential different solutions, choose between them. And a lot of the different work you've each talked about sort of slices and dices and looks at different stages. I'm kind of curious to hear from all of you about what the big picture looks like and how we think about those different processes integrating and if requires a different solution. So I'll start if you want. Um, I actually like the way you framed the question uh, that uh, it's kind of a process. In fact, um, I, I'm, ha I'm having the increasingly strong intuition that one of the best languages for thinking about collective intelligence. You say for physics, the language is math. I think for collective intelligence, the core language may be processes. In other words, to the degree we can precisely, systematically, and powerfully describe processes, I think that gives us a very powerful language for understanding, analyzing, evaluating, and inventing intelligent systems or supermaps. In a certain sense, computer science probably has the same truth. That is, computer science is probably more about processes than about math. Uh, so I think that's one important way to think about all these things, that to the degree you want to understand and analyze this from a collective intelligence point of view, it's a matter of mapping the processes that are involved. Uh, I also think, as you said, that almost every real situation involves multiple kinds of superminds, multiple kinds of uh, decision-making entities, uh, multiple kinds of processes. What I showed you was the different kinds of decision-making superminds. But another thing I did in the book was characterize different kinds of cognitive processes, creating options, deciding among, option, among options, sensing, remembering, and learning. So I think for each of those processes, you can also characterize different ways of doing it, processes for doing it. And I think that gives you uh, not only a language, but a rich set of possibilities for combining in many different ways, potentially many innovative ways, to do things we want to do. Make sense? I can tell you my heuristics I have seen. Uh, one I read somewhere called combinatorial creativity. It says you look at ideas in different places and see if you can mix them up and get something interesting. So given a lot of free time I have as a chair professor in tenure, uh, you know, it's good to read and see answers everywhere. And I don't know where something will play out, in what form or what combination, but just having an inventory of various things that may or may not have worked somewhere and see how I can mix them up uh, in some way. Can I use private jets for the poor, uh, right? Uh, and one of the tricks that I like personally uh, is uh, what I call maximally inverse. I gave a talk at Harvard recently, so I had to make up some catch -up. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'll tell you where I got this idea from. When I was a kid, uh, in a lot of physics, um, I thought the most uh, uh, dramatic way of explaining Einstein versus Newton was this. Newton thought uh, that planets go in curves on flat spaces. And Einstein said that makes no sense. Actually, the space time is curved. The planets are going in straight lines in that space. So what caught my attention was, not only was Newton wrong, he couldn't have been more wrong, right? And that's what made Einstein Einstein. So ever since as a kid, what I want to achieve is to do something that is exactly opposite to 300 years of great scientific thought, okay? So I keep looking for solutions that are actually the very opposite of what everybody wants. So when people said, people are not sharing organs, we got to redistrict, we need to go talk to our congressman, I said, no, I'm gonna transfer the patients to the organs, not the organs to the patients. That is, I'm just gonna do the inverse. And when people said, we need to increase the number of people donating organs by signing them up at DMV, I said, no, 
let's go find the people who are dead who were not signed up and see what we can do about it. So my heuristic has always been, can I use ideas from somewhere in some combination? And whenever I can find something that I can do the opposite of what other great people are thinking, that's what I go for because I think that that could be an opportunity that people are not looking at. So that's kind of my, my little heuristics. One thing that we all had in common is that none of us talked about uh, problems that have a single solution and then it's over, but instead um, ongoing processes, as Tom just said. So uh, fixing climate change, uh, dealing with climate change is never going to be over. And um, distributing organs among people is never going to be over. And um, all of the different kinds of work that you're trying to do, or even what um, an ant colony does all day, like the ant doesn't get up in the morning and say, okay, Today we have to forage and uh, we'll just you know, do our best at foraging until we're done. But instead foraging is part of what they do and not foraging is part of what they do and it just goes on and on. So, and democracy is another example. Sometimes we have an election, sometimes we don't have an election, you know, but it's always ongoing. So I think that maybe the, the idea of framing things as discrete problems um, um, impedes our uh, capacity to understand how collective processes work. I, I, I really think there's two things that I've been focused on. One is how do you defeat the orthodoxy? It seems like so many different fields that I've touched on personally, whether it's international development or conservation or, or, or others, there are fads about why we do things. And they're not based in evidence and they're not based in science. So being able to use people, use multidisciplinarity to be able to break out of that is really important. One issue that conservation has always had is we tended to fight against human behavior rather than harness it. We create red lists that actually drive poaching of those species that are endangered because we're not thinking about the behavioral effects of what we are doing. The second is, is, is um, I think, thinking, thinking about... Um, I just lost my train of thought. So I'll stop with fads. I think that is, that is good. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you all for the amazing talks. It was really, really amazing. And uh, so I come from the, from the world of um, agile product development. And I'll, especially a lot of the stuff that uh, Alex mentioned in his talk struck a chord with me from the point of view of, of practice. And it, it really strikes me how, how there's uh, some convergent evolution there between uh, what agile practitioners have in the last, last uh, 20 or 30 years uncovered about you know, loops of action, experimentation, and learning, and the fact that these these problems, they, they are never actually solved. And they just, as, as you do things, you just often just uncover another layer of the, of the, the problem. Uh, and my question is really, uh, to what extent uh, do you guys, uh, have you guys explore, explored uh, this, this uh, parallel in the, in, when trying to connect to, to practical applications in, uh, in not, not just in organizations, in traditional businesses, but in other places where, ag where Agile and uh, these uh, more industry related you know, frameworks uh, have been experimented. As, for instance, I know that there's, uh, there's happening a movement in uh, agile science, agile academia. I know of a little bit of agile government. And that, that seems like it has a lot of uh, exploitable parallels to, to what we're talking about here. If I can, if I can start with that. Um, yeah. So I, I was a participant in the last political campaign my side lost. Uh, just full disclosure, uh, but one of the things we were looking at was adaptive USAID procurement policies, because one of the problems we have is you have these contracts that are literally five-year contracts, and if you deviate from the contracts, the inspector general comes and literally destroys your company and can prevent, you know, they have come in and done that, but the situation is nature is fluid. Things are constantly changing. The situation's constantly changing. So there's this tension of how do you actually allow for true adaptability and, and balance that against making sure that people are meeting the terms of the objectives uh, that's out there. And that's not easy. And I think the same thing, the second point I had from my last comment is sort of related to it, is this period, you know, the, we have this idea of the tyranny of experts that is out there, but you still need to ground truth things 
and they, they still have to be tied to some degree of reality that influences it. So agile there, I think, makes a huge difference. I'll make one other comment about that. Uh, I think the idea of applying agile methodologies or agile processes in lots of other domains is a really interesting idea. Uh, the maybe provocative comment I'd make is what I suspect is true is that there are thousands of other ideas just as good as agile that we haven't thought of yet. What are some of those? Check. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so my question is kind of uh, uh, takes follow on on what Alex just said that there are fads in uh, uh, what we are trying to look at and call wicked or complex problems, socio technical problems. Uh, so is there an underlying question of trying to frame them uh, in a more uh, robust way, for lack of a better term, by using what we spoke of this morning, uh, collective intelligence of social media uh, in a positive light? And uh, do you see uh, 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 an issue with that? That, uh, that I'm not able to think about because that seems to me like a potential here. Um, so yes, I think so. So the World, the, the World Bank came out with a report a few years ago on the role of behavior in, and behavioral science actually in international development. This question of framing is really important. For us, it's really understanding like on the prices and tactics, what constraint if solved was assumption if tested, would actually lead to the biggest breakthrough? What is the evidence across the millions of potential assumptions that you could actually test that are out there? And I think that is important. Collective intelligence could help us actually get some of those novel insights, but it's very hard to actually work through uh, efficiently the large numbers. Of I've tried to get a community to help generate grand challenges for us, but, I, but that's also been harder. It's been much more, it has to be far more curated that question is really important. Okay, please join me in thanking our panelists. We'll meet back here at 3.15.